Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome you to the 26th lecture of the course Management Organizational Policies and Practices. Let's have a recap of lecture 25, which was on change management. We saw that uh, what are the different forces in the organization's environment that are affecting the organization. So uh, we discussed the macro environment of the organization and a number of factors uh, involved in the macro environment that we discussed were the technological factors such as the technological innovations, the product changes uh, that uh, that uh, that forced organizations to make changes in their products or in their services um, in order to uh, uh, keep uh, uh, in order to uh, fit themselves in line with the technological changes. Um, then we had a discussion of uh, the different um, um, we had a discussion of uh, uh, different uh, demographic factors that are influencing the organizations such as the composition of the workforce, the labor force composition in a way that uh, uh, now more and more diverse um, uh, uh, back people from the diverse background were entering the labor force and resultantly they are posing the diversity management issues for the organizations and they have the implications for the organizations in terms of the um, higher number of the green population and uh, because of the lower percentages of the um, um, uh, of the young people entering the labor force because of the uh, declining uh, population growth rate and uh, we discussed a number of other uh, issues relating to the demographic uh, uh, composition which are uh, forcing the uh, changes in the uh, in the organizational environment uh, then um, we had also had a dis discussion on the economic factors that are influencing the um, organization such as the changes in the interest rates, changes in the inflation rates and uh, the economic booms and the economic recessions, how they affect the organization. Uh, it's, um, uh, um, you all need to uh, think of the different uh, such as the, uh, the, the, the changes in the economy as a result of the 9-11 attacks, the economic san sanctions that were imposed um, on the organizations uh, or on the, the uh, on the operations in the Pakistan, the import and export ratios in the quotas and the, and the tariff rates etc. So um, all these factors they have and then the, in, in the implications of the international uh, trade agencies and the other international bodies, what implications they have, the changes in their rules and regulations, how they influence the um, organizations um, um, in a country, uh, the changes taking place internationally, how they influence the organizations uh, at, uh, in a country. So uh, these are all the different and then the changes in the uh, uh, um, other important export ratios from the economy such as China, how they are influencing our market, right? Um, um, how the Chinese uh, uh, exports, they have spread so much in globally and uh, in the developing countries uh, such as Pakistan as well, what are the challenges for this kind of regime and the, for the free trade regime to the infant industries in Pakistan and to the other industries in Pakistan which are not that competitive, how when they have to compete in a free trade regime where, where they will no more be protected uh, by way of the trade barriers, when they have to compete with the low priced goods of the um, uh, 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 other of the other um, exporting countries um, what are the in influences for those organizations of uh, this kind of regimes right so there are a number of factors in the external in the macro environment that influence the organization and that have implications for the organization to make changes uh, in order to uh, in, in order to stay in business and in order to keep uh, competitive because if they won't um, change in response to those driving forces which are bringing the change uh, then um, they won't be able to keep pace uh, with the market economy they won't be able to keep pace with the competitors and they will be left behind and they will ultimately be uh, forced um, out of business then we see that how the changes uh, that are faced by the organization that they are or the, that occur in the organization they can be planned or they can be unplanned i give you an example of the unplanned changes wherein a uh, um, uh, plant manager he has to or a hotel manager has to respond to the um, uh, to the combined request of the employees that if they are not given the flex time uh, they, they will quit the uh, the hotel and they will search the job elsewhere where they are given more flexibility to work
So um, that that is a form of a, that that is a type of unplanned change that we discussed. Then we also had a discussion of the planned changes that how, for example, an organization it wants to restructure itself or it wants to uh, uh, bring in uh, it wants to consolidate. Then how that consolidation attempt on the part of the organization. Um, uh, then th uh, as a result of that consolidation attempt, what are the steps that organization is going to take? For example, it has if it has um, three uh, three ma uh, manufacturing plants and it wants to close down one manufacturing plants or it wants to close down two manufacturing plants and merge that into the, the other uh, one uh, other manufacturing plant so uh, it, it, this is a consolidation strategy that the firm is uh, using and how it is going to materialize that consolidation what are the implications for the different departments of the organization uh, of the organization of the plants that are going to shut down and uh, what about their human resources and what about their assets and the other infrastructure and um, what are the implications for the human resources of the plant that is going to um, uh, stay so what are the uh, um, how the firm is going to uh, execute all those uh, changes how it is going to um, uh, if it has to lay off lay off some of the employees how it has to communicate those layoff decisions to those employees of the manufacturing plants that are going to be shut down and um, how uh, the, the it is going to use a fair procedure in uh, in in laying off some of the employees while uh, keeping uh, behind some others what are the influences of the such layoffs for the survivors for the motivation of those survivors about the commitment of those survivors right so it has a number of implications how the firm has to bring changes in the behaviors of the survivors and um, how it has to manage the behavior of the survivors how it has to manage the behavior of the uh, the people who have been laid off because it might be quite devastating for them and they might become very violent right and um, so these are the number of the a few changes that the organization will have to face uh, or it has to plan all those changes um, not only at the level of the machinery at the level of the plant at the level level of assets or at the level of processes but also at the level of the behaviors and the attitudes of the people so when an organization is planning a change it has to plan uh, top down it has to plan from uh, from a to z right at all levels it needs to plan it's about planning about everything about the production about the processes about the operations uh, right and um, about the behavior and attitudes of the people as well right um then we see that there are different approaches to managing change uh, uh, the, how, how you have to overcome this resistance and what is this resistance to change we had a discussion um, on this resistance to change and the factors that uh, that are responsible for this resistance to change and how it can be uh, overcome right so um, uh, we see that there are a number of individual factors that are uh, that that are causes for resistance to change. For example, the they have the individuals they just have this fear of unknown. They have the economic fears. They have the security issues that they have. They are in into a job and uh, they, it is going a routine in a uh, it has become their habit in a routine way. They come to their offices, do certain tasks, do it in a certain way, and then they go off. You use a particular kind of process, use a particular system, and then they go off. But now suddenly when uh, you are working in an office on a um, on one software and suddenly you are asked that now the software has changed and we have a new better software to work and uh, you need to get a training on that software to use that software and you have to do all your uh, f work on that software now so it will of course be a, re a resistance for the employees right so um, the employees they will naturally feel resistant towards uh, because the that will that will be out of their routine they will have to learn it and uh, th there is also a little fear in the minds of the individuals that how it is going to work for them whether they'll be able to really effectively handle that or not how it will affect their performance their productivity especially when their productivity and performance they know that it is going to be their 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 pays and their promotions they're going to be linked to their pro performance and productivity and they have heavily heavily reliant on that software for their performance and productivity so um, there are certain fears that arise in the minds of the individuals that how and whether they will be able to uh, learn the new uh, skills effectively and um, how it is going to influence them because previously they were uh, into a set routine into a set procedure they 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 had their hands on experience on using the software that they were previously using it was giving them a level of the output or production that was uh, 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 that was up to their satisfaction or uh, with which they were going on in their routines. 
uh, and now they don't know how the things are going to shape up and what are the consequences of this introduction of this new software so they have certain factors of uh, there they have certain a uh, number of facets uh, or a number of factors that are um, that are posing this resistance to change and then uh, how we discussed that how the organization can overcome this resistance to change and we discussed a number of strategies uh, that the organization can use to overcome this resistance and um, among which we had a discussion on uh, the different um, uh, the, uh, the ed education edu educating the employees about the requirement that why it is needed to uh, bring that resistance to change uh, why, is, why is it necessary to bring that change and why they should not be resistant to change well but they should be acceptable of this change so educate the employees that why it is important and educate all the groups of, uh, of all the groups in, within the organization uh, to whom this change is relevant right and um, not only educate them but uh, also show them by value by calculations that the proposed change the desired change is not only valuable for the shareholders but it is also equally valuable for the employees and the other uh, stakeholder groups in the organization right and, and then you, you of course uh, a very common way and very uh, uh, desired way of uh, winning the commitment of the employees and reducing the resistance to changes by way of participation then um, uh, you take them in the decision making process involve them in the problem uh, in the problem uh, indicating process in the problem solving process in the decision making process uh, the greater their involvement the more participative they are the more they are likely to own the um, the, the actions uh, or the to be taken to solve the uh, problem or the changes that need to be made then we also had a discussion on the different manipulation cooptation strategies mm -hmm. um, and we also had a discussion about uh, how the managers they can use this question strategy to um, reduce this uh, resistance to change and how uh, the manager management it needs to support the employees to win their commitment by providing them the necessary skills and trainings and in and addressing their uh, their unknown fears um, then we had uh, discussed uh, the two different approaches to managing change one was uh, the Lewin's uh, three-step change model um, in which he explained that how first in the first step towards bringing a change is that you need to unfreeze from uh, the, uh, the the previous uh, uh, equilibrium that the firm or the individuals they are uh, there uh, they are on uh, you unfreeze that and uh, and, and then uh, you um, in the second stage you uh, come into a new equilibrium and you uh, mm, uh, and in the third stage you need to rephrase yourself into the new equilibrium position uh, then we had a discussion of the quarters eight step plan for implementing change then we had a discussion about this organizational development that what are the different uh, uh, steps or what are the different approaches or the strategies that are taken by the organizations to bring the organizational interventions that can enhance the organizational um, effectiveness um, and the organizational uh, performance then we had a discussion about this uh, uh, creating culture for change that how this culture for change in the organization it can be created how um, uh, the innovation can be brought about in the organization why the innovation in the organization is important for change because we uh, know that the, we, we had a discussion on a number of determinants of this innovative culture in the organizations and we saw that the organizations that are more organic in nature or in structure they are uh, they, they, they have more flatter structures and they're more flexible and um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the hierarchical relationships and the traditional authority and control are not there in those organizations therefore they are more open to change and they are more supportive of change and that innovation is likely to be more in that kind of organizations we also discussed that the, the tenure of the manager is uh, uh, can also be an important indicator of the innovation in the organization so the greater the tenure the manager has in the organization more time you have spent more experience you have with the organization the more familiar you you, ha you are you become with the organizational products and the organizational processes and how uh, to efficiently handle them how to um, um, how you can bring changes in them how you can uh, um, you, it is becomes easier for you even to um, uh, even to understand the nature of the problems to identify the problems you are more apt to identify the problems when you are when you've spent more time with the organization with the routine processes and products so you have because you have a better uh, mental map 
uh, in your mind uh, on uh, how the things are working in the organization what is the map of the things uh, the uh, of the work that is taking place in the organization you have a better mental map to that so and um, as a result you are more capable of uh, of identifying the problem and for um, uh, searching for the alternate solutions to the problem and for making better decisions and making the uh, bringing new ideas and new ways of doing the things uh, in the organization so the innovation is expected to be more in uh, in, in uh, this kind of um, situations then we had a discussion on the learning organization that how the organization it becomes a learning organization when it continuously adapts to the changes in the external environment and when it is a culture that is prone to um, uh, learning it is again uh, it welcomes the new experiences and it welcomes the uh, risky decisions of the employees and it is not a risk averse organization right and it is uh, continuously uh, learning from the external environment and assimilating that learning into uh, its uh, its own culture and its own structure and uh, uh, by disseminating the information uh, uh, getting new information from the external market and assimilating that information and disseminating that information to the different organizational members and then that information and and, uh, and everything that becomes a part of the organization and when this process continuously change keeps on occurring then that organization is a learning organization because it is constantly responding to the environmental cues right um so uh, th th that was our discussion for the uh, lecture on uh, change for management uh, on how the management uh, can manage the change uh, what are the different forces and the influences on this change management process for today's lecture we are going to discuss the organizational uh, culture and the conflict management uh, what are the different goals that we have set for this lecture uh, first we should be able to relate institutionalization to organizational culture then define organizational culture and describe its common characteristics you should be able to compare the functional and dysfunctional effects of organizational culture on people and the organization you should be able to explain the factors that create and sustain an organization's culture you should be able to show how culture is transmitted to employees you should be able to demonstrate how an ethical culture can be created you should be able to describe a positive organizational culture and you should know how national culture may affect the way organizational culture is transported to a different country so these are all the different learning outcomes that we have from today's lecture so what is organizational culture of course we all are familiar with this term organizational culture we all are, are somehow familiar because in uh, most of the discussions in most of the talk topics that we are talking about whether they are in the context of organizational behavior or they are in the context of human resource management or industrial organizational psychology or general management thoughts principles theories philosophies you know, policies the role of organizational culture it can not, not be underestimated it has so, such a strong imprint on the employee attitudes on the employee behaviors and on the organizational overall standing and on the organization overall image that um, uh, that its influences on the uh, different organizationally relevant and individual relevant outcomes they are very strong they have been reported to be very strong and therefore it uh, the uh, its role it can not be underestimated so we have an understanding that organizational culture it is basically a common perception that is held by the organization's members a system of shared meaning so this is a system uh, or this is a, the, the 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 shared meaning that the organizational members they develop about the organization the perceptions that they commonly hold about the organization that is the organizational culture so uh, th this is also termed as the value system of the organization the norms of the organization the ways of doing things in the organization the expected behavior in the organization the do's and don'ts in the organization so these all terms they refer to the organizational culture and all these ways things beliefs norms of doing things they are all shared they are all combined by all the members of the organization uh, then uh, what are the different characteristics of the organizational culture innovation and risk taking so certain organizations they can be more innovative and they can be more risk taking so that would be their culture but 
certain organizations may not be uh, innovative they might be more stable uh, uh, stable organizations and they might uh, prefer the stable uh, ways of responding and doing things and some other organizations they might be more uh, risk averse organizations right so the, these can be the different there uh, there are a few examples how of how different organizations they can form different organizational cultures depending upon uh, their uh, their value system and depending upon their, uh, their their management's commitment and so on so we'll be discussing a number of factors that how the organizational culture is formed uh, why it is formed like that right but uh, the different cultures they can depict different characteristics and here are a few examples of those characteristics for you then the attention to detail some organizations such as they they give greater attention to detail they are really perfectionist type of organizations right and uh, some other they are uh, not they don't give that much uh, attention to the details and they're not that perfectionist then the outcome orientation some organizations they are really focused on this uh, the outcomes not on the the products or not on the processes which are used um, uh, to arrive at the outcomes but they are more uh, uh, more interested in outcomes that what is the uh, what are the uh, what are the total number of units produced or what are the um, how many sales have been made but not in the process that was used or not in the products that were used but in the outcomes so they are outcome oriented organizations and uh, so some organizations they can also be the process oriented organizations input oriented organizations that how the work was done how the contributions were made right what processes were used how the jobs were designed they focus more on that right uh, then uh, some organizations they are uh, basically people oriented right they really caring and uh, uh, caring for people listening to their problems and also considering their goals and their individual values while making the organizational goals and organizational values right and um, showing a concern for the uh, for, for the people's needs and their demands and uh, their motivations right so the, they, they are the people oriented organizations right and some, some organizations they can also be the task oriented organizations right so they, they just want to get work done right and they are not much uh, uh, care for the st uh, for the for, for the employees or the for the other stakeholders right so uh, such as the organizations that work on the um, uh, um, on the basis of this uh, shareholder model in which they only want to maximize the profit and the only purpose of the existence of the organizations is the profitability maximization uh, what happens in the shareholder model right so um, they are the kind of the organizations and the team orientation uh, so, uh, some organizations they are this uh, team oriented uh, compared to the other organizations that are individual oriented or where the tasks are designed in a way that the, they are individualized tasks and the team oriented organization therein the work is done through teams or the, through the formation of the groups right so the group tasks group uh, uh, group activities and uh, the uh, group performances and the group rewards right uh, then the uh, um, aggressiveness some are more aggressive and some are uh, uh, some are not some are uh, uh, just as uh, as i told you that they prefer the stability right <clears throat> so the aggressive organizations they can for example can be expected to bring these uh, radical changes uh, or the radical innovations and the stable organizations they are expected to be into this uh, um, incremental changes or the incremental innovations right so very few and very steady and small changes responding to the external environment while the radical um, uh, the aggressive organizations they can be more into more the radical uh, innovations i have uh, uh, two um, cases of the two organizations for you organization a and the next slide is organization b i read out these uh, uh, these two contrasting organizational cultures of these organizations a and b and it will be interesting for you to see that how the organizations these two organizations because of their different norms and expectations and the values how they are um, they have the entirely different cultures and entirely different outlooks and how the ex uh, the in individuals they can be expected to behave entirely differently um, in these two different organizations right so we have the organization a which is a manufacturing firm managers are expected to fully doc <coughs> and document all decisions and good managers are those who can provide detailed data to support their recommendations so they so these are the organizations that this is the organization that gives expect uh, that yeah, that gives really attention to detail right and uh, then uh, this uh, creative decisions that incur significant change or risk they are not encouraged so it is more a kind of a, um, a stable organization because managers um, of failed projects are openly criticized and penalized managers 
try not to implement ideas that deviate much from the status quo so the characteristics of a stable organization where the innovation is not encouraged then a uh, one lower level manager quoted an often used phrase in the company if it ain't broke bro, uh, broke don't fix it right so the uh, the culture of the initiative and the culture of aggressiveness that is not supported so unless something has gone wrong you don't need to do anything about it um, while that does not happen in the organizations that have the more risk taking and the more innovative culture and that, that have more aggressive approach then there are extensive rules and regulations in this firm that employees are required to follow managers supervise employees closely to ensure there are no deviations right so there are strict controls there are strict rules and regulations there are more uh, more of a you can say that bureau bureaucratic structure in this organization and the employees they have to stick to those rules and they are strict they have to strict uh, be in strict compliance with those rules and regulations and they are to be monitored by their managers on uh, if there uh, there are any deviations then management is concerned with high productivity regardless of the impact on employee morale or turnover so as we discussed that this the, the, that uh, this is not the characteristic of an employee oriented culture but this is a very task oriented culture where the preference or where the importance is given to the task orientation or, or, or to the productivity and the performance but not to uh, the employee morale and employee attitude and employee turnover and to their satisfaction and commitment then the work activities they are designed around individuals there are distinct departments and lines of authority and employees are expected to minimize formal contact with other employees outside their functional area or line of command so it is uh, the uh, the organization follows a strict organiz uh, functional structure wherein the different there is departmentalization and there are uh, and the different on the basis of the activities of the, or the on the basis of the different jobs the uh, different activities they have been uh, departmentalized right and, um, and there is an, an, and between these departments the encouragement is that there is minimal contact between these uh, departments right and the formal there is line of command and that has to be followed then the performance evaluation and rewards they emphasize individual effort although seniority tends to be the primary factor in the determination of pay raises and promotion so here the next is the, what we see is that the performance appraisals or the performance uh, um, uh, evaluations that are done on an individual basis which means that this is not a team oriented culture and um, seniority tends to be the primary factor in the determination of pay raises and promotions then on the other hand we have the organization b culture let's see that how this culture is contrasting the a organization's culture this is again another manufacturing firm so we ha we have a very good comparison both are manufacturing firms here however management encourages and rewards risk taking and change decisions based on intuition are valued as much as those that are well rationalized management prides itself on its history of experimenting with new technologies and its success in regularly introducing uh, innovation products managers or employees who have a good idea are encouraged to run with it right so innovation is encouraged in innovation oriented culture and failures are treated as learning experiences the company prides itself on being market driven and rapidly responsive to the changing needs of the customers so more aggressive more innovative culture but not stable right um at risk taking also there are few rules and uh, regulations for employees to follow and supervision is loose because management believes that its, its, its employees are hard working and trustworthy so management concerned with high productivity but believes that this comes through treating its people right right so they are employee oriented uh, the company is proud of its reputation and as being a good place to work job activities are designed around work teams team oriented and team members are encouraged to interact with people across functions and authority levels employees talk positively about the competition between teams individuals and teams have goals but bonuses are based to on achievement of these outcomes employees are given considerable autonomy in choosing the means by which um, the goals are attained right so there is considerable autonomy and there is task significance and uh, the design jobs are designed rich in this culture compared to the organization a culture where the jobs were not rich so, right so there was no em employees were not empowered here in the employees are empowered they can make the decisions right and um, they have the autonomy uh, to uh, the, how they have to achieve the goals right and uh, uh, there are the rules and regulations are not that strict right and the previous uh, organization is culture we saw that the 
uh, employees do not have much autonomy and they have to follow the strict rules and regulations and they're uh, they are being uh, measured or they are being supervised by their managers against any deviations if they do from the uh, workplace rules and policies and regulations so uh, if we kept on making the comparison at all the different stages in these two descriptions that how their cultures differ then the culture is descriptive of course the people's shared understanding of the organizational characteristics it does not express their liking or disliking people at different hierarchy levels departments they develop uniform perceptions of culture right so it is not about their personal liking or disliking but it is about how the things are like right and how the organizational characteristics are so it is a shared perception of the individuals about that right and whether you are at a top level manager or you're a bottom level manager or you are a shop floor worker or you're a ceo culture is one which is shared by employees at all levels right so irrespective of your hierarchical level you share the same perceptions or you have the same ideas about how this organization is like like what are the norms and values of this organization so there is uniform perception that is the organizational culture then uh, an organization can have a dominant culture and can also have a some sub subcultures -sub the dominant culture is uh, the one that expresses the core values that are shared by a majority of the organization's members so it is uh, it is uh, on the level of the organization on the whole that is the dominant culture that what are the overall values or what are the, what is the overall value system or the norms of the organization overall expectations of the whole organization what it promotes what it does not promote and what messages it give and what it does not give right subcultures they uh, they can be a number of subcultures within that mean or within that dominant organizational culture so the dominant culture this uh, also we can say that the corporate culture of the organization right and the subcultures they are the many cultures within an organization typically defined by department designations and geographical separations such as the different um, sbus in our organization they can have the different uh, meaning uh, subcultures right uh, the different sbus having the different subcultures because then sbu wise the geographical uh, 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 distribution wise or the uh, by the department wise even within a same uh, within one SPU under the different functions that it is performing each function might have a different mini culture or a different subculture right and um, but the overall dominant culture or over the organization or the corporate culture that is uh, one within the organization and that dominant and the corporate culture is basically the identity of that organization that how that is like and your many cultures they also need to be and they must uh, be in line with that uh, corporate or the dominant culture and uh, that com dom dominant culture is basically a guide to all the different um, sub departments or the sub units or the, uh, the the different divisions of the organization or whatever they, they are that is basically a guide that how uh, they are uh, the, the other cultures they should expected to grow so they grow they might be some changes in those some mini cultures but they are in line with the dominant culture so the core values are the dominant values that are accepted throughout the organizations that are that come from the this dominant culture and um, uh, then this uh, strong culture is the one in which the core values are intensely held and widely shared right so that is a strong culture if the organization does not have a strong culture then it means that the its value system or the signals through which it, uh, the values are being sent to the different individuals they are uh, they, they are not strong in a weak culture right and in a weak culture the shared perce perceptions they are uh, not strong right or uh, different individuals if they have different perceptions about uh, same uh, behavior or how our behavior should be performed then it means that they uh, their uh, values are not shared or their perceptions are not shared their expectations or uh, or their expect their understanding is not shared about how certain things should go and should not go then that is not a strong culture that is a weak culture strong culture is one is one in which the shared there is shared understanding and in which there is a, a strong signals coming from the organization to the members that okay this act is uh, is uh, commendable and this act is punishable we should do this way and we should not do this way then uh, uh, associate strong culture is associated with positive organizational outcomes such as performance profitability and growth etc so uh, what are the different elements of a strong culture if I um, explain uh, to you um, a study shows that uh, uh, there are uh, three factors that can contribute to this formation of the strong culture that determine the strength of the culture 
um, one is that uh, this uh, consistency that there should be consistency between the organizational uh, policies right so if the an organization is a team uh, oriented culture if it has a team oriented culture then one there should be uh, uh, that work should be designed around teams those the individuals who are within that team they should uh, um, they should be individually and they should be mutually accountable for their performance right and the uh, the, the performance uh, rewards they should be tied uh, to their collective effort but not to their individual effort so that is that the policies they are consistent so if you are uh, your work design is such that you are following this uh, teamwork right then within the teamwork you one you tie the performance of the employees with that teamwork they are accountable mutually and two you also tie their performance evaluations uh, their 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 rewards with the collective collective effort or with the collective output but not with the individual output so because uh, if uh, one if you are uh, uh, giving them the tasks that are group tasks or the group goals but you are um, uh, measuring their performance on the individual uh, output then there is not a uh, match between these two uh, practices right so then that will not uh, these it means that the uh, there is no uh, not consistency between the practices and it will not give a strong image to the or it will not give a strong uh, uh, strong signals to the individuals or the team members right about the team orientation or about the team oriented culture and their culture will become weak then the consensus there should be consensus between the managers and uh, at all levels about the development of the culture right so when um, a certain practices uh, practices implemented in the organization there should be consensus between the managers at all levels because if there is no consensus between managers they are not agreed themselves one manager has a different opinion and other manager has a different opinion then again it is not going to give very strong signals to the individuals right so if i have i have two bosses and one boss is saying one thing and the other is saying one thing they are not agreeing with each other uh, then um, of course it's not going to give me and the, my colleagues a very strong signals right about particular HR practices or whatever so uh, then that is again uh, uh, in, uh, uh, it will again weaken the culture because the signals will be weak the shared perceptions will be weak so one employee he might perceive uh, what the uh, one manager is saying another employee might perceive one what an other manager is saying and they the shared perceptions won't be able to uh, develop right and the strong message won't be coming right because there is no agreement between the managers themselves then they should be distinct the practices the employees they should be able to see that one this practice is or this uh, policy that is being adopted by the organization and the, this is another policy that has been adopted in an organization and these policies they are distinct from each other and uh, they are uh, uh, and that they are related to the distinct outcomes as well Th that should be there if that element is not there again the culture is not going to be strong so the strong and positive culture that may include empowering employees having team orientation clear strategic direction should be there and there should be a strong vision so these are the factors that can promote a strong culture um, okay then w culture versus uh, formalization if we make a uh, comparison between the two the formalization we know that in the formalization there is uh, the rules and regulations and the policies they are very uh, clear right and everything is formalized as the name indicates right uh, but uh, the, the research and the theory states that if um, the uh, culture um, is strong in an organization then even the lesser degree of uh, formalization will be enough in the organization and because a strong organizational culture that will uh, replace the uh, for uh, the level of the formalization in the the low level of formalization in the organization and that strong culture will act as a uh, formalization in the organization because still the members they will be getting strong signals that of sanctioned behaviors and of the desired behaviors right uh, so the uh, strong culture it increases the behavioral consistency and can act as a substitute for formalization then the organizational culture versus national culture if we make a comparison national culture of course it has a greater impact on the employees then does their organizational culture because of course when the individual is uh, born since then uh, he, he gets uh, starts getting the uh, Im imprints on his mind about the values of that uh, uh, of his country of his nation uh, and the uh, the norms uh, from he uh, from from the from his parents from his family and from the his external uh, environment he starts getting the cues 
of the desirable behaviors and undesirable behaviors and how the nation as a nation um, what are the uh, different expectations from him as a as that particular nation's member right so of course national culture has a very strong and deep down impact compared to the organizational culture which the individual might have joined some some period ago so the nationals they selected to work for foreign companies they may be atypical of the local native population that is the reason because um, if you um, uh, and that is a reason some of the companies they uh, um, also um, and they also tend to fail such as the, if i quote you the example of the walmart which is a very one of the uh, largest retailers in the world when they ent entered the german market and they opened their walmart store there they could not succeed there because they try to implement their uh, corporate culture into the german market where and we know that in germany the, uh, the 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 trade unions are very strong and the germans own culture is very strong and the people are very particular about their norms and their values right and uh, when the walmart it, it tried to uh, it opened up its outlet in the in the germany and they tried to introduce their own dress code their own language in there the people they are they they, are, uh, they, they speak germany and they only tend to speak Ger germany they don't want to speak english they are not very responsive to that so uh, when uh, when the walmart it tried to introduce its own culture while while operating in the territory of germany the people they were uh, resistant to that and the germany because of majorly because of the cultural differences because of the differences in the dress code because in the ex uh, the, the expectations of the managers uh, from the employees who were uh, uh, who, uh, the employees who were basically the hired from the german labor market so there were differences between them there were differences in their languages in their expectations in the ways of doing things in the value system there were differences what the managers who were basically coming from the walmart um, uh, and, um, and who were the main the U, from the U.S. origin, how they were the differences in their value systems, and they expected the people, the employees who were hired from the German labor market, they expected them to behave and to adopt their values. But that was not possible because they were, those were the values in the German employees that were coming from their national culture, right? So in that organization, they could not adopt those values because they were not, they did not own those values. Of that organization right so national culture is uh, greater uh, impact on the employee than the organizational culture so uh, what does a culture do it has uh, some important functions to perform basically it it, it it defines the boundary between one organization and the other organization right so it is a kind of an identity of the organization right so it conveys a sense of identity for its members and it is also the uh, uh, organization culture also sets its own identity when it is uh, def when, when it is uh, making a boundary from one organization from the other organization then it facilitates the generation of commitment to something larger than self interest then it enhances the stability of the social system it serves as a sense making and control mechanism for fitting employees in the organization uh, and you must all be, be familiar with this uh, the, this Disneyland and the Disney theme parks uh, they uh, the employees there they are attractive universally owing to the strong culture at Disney uh, the employees they uh, are known to be friendly clean and attractive so that is the culture that is prevalent in Disney and the employees there are known worldwide and they are being, being they are very attractive worldwide for that so um, this is how the culture it becomes the identity of the organization and it also becomes the identity of the individuals culture can uh, sometimes become a liability and when are those cases uh, one when it becomes a barrier to change um, we know that uh, uh, sometimes when the organizations they follow a certain kind of a culture and they are uh, sticking to that culture for making the, their organizational decisions or when the culture of the organization is very uh, uh, stable, it is not very aggressive and it is not very innovative, right, then uh, <coughs> it can uh, and the organization is uh, operating in a stable environment but uh, um, it's not very open to change, it's not very learning organization, it is not very responsive to the external environment changes and the managers they uh, keep on making the decisions in the organization basing on the past uh, on their on the history 
right and the, the, such as what were the what were the tre trends for the pro uh, product in the past and what are the trends now and so on so um, uh, it, these are the cases in which the uh, even when an organization is operating very successfully but it may not keep on operating successfully in the future uh, uh, because the culture might be very much closed right and uh, it might not be very responsive right and the managers they may also uh, uh, be a little afraid uh, they might be a little uh, afraid of the change um, uh, that might be the requirement from the external uh, environment but the managers they might be uh, afraid because the things are happening uh, the processes and the routines and the behaviors of the people they are set their their, their habits have uh, uh, are being made right and the routines have developed and uh, the managers might be afraid that uh, if they bring in any change in the organization that might be very um, the employees may not respond very positively to that change and uh, um, yeah, the employees the managers they are uh, afraid of those environment uh, responses of the employees uh, so uh, they may not uh, bring the change even if they know at heart that the change is required right so sometimes the change is not brought um, and sometimes it's not only the employees who are resistant to change but sometimes the managers themselves are resistant to change because of the fears that they have in their minds um, right so um, in th that kind of cases where the organizational culture is really strong right and then the it, it be uh, culture itself becomes a barrier to change when it is strong right uh, so um, and in that this kind of cases the uh, strategic drift can occur we uh, I, I explained to you I think in one of my presentations that what the concept of the strategic drift that even if the firm has core competencies in certain areas and as a result of those competent core competencies they are providing the firm the strategic advantage in the market and they are competitive in the market but those core competencies um, are um, uh, th those core competencies. They are um, uh, they, they can become the uh, they can become the core rigidities of the companies if they don't keep on constantly updating those core competencies in response to the external environment. So, if the a firm is uh, such as um, uh, if a firm is. Uh, uh, very much technologically abreast right uh, uh, it is competing on the basis of the technology such as if we take the example of Apple which is competing on the basis of the technology and it is bringing constant innovations radical innovations into uh, the products that it, it is offering right so if it if it stops bringing those radical innovations into its products so that though that technology and those radical innovations are basically the uh, the the uh, core competence of air Apple if it stops bringing those technological advancements and continually if it stops to update its products then it won't be able to stay competitive in the market in the long run and its core competencies will become its core rigidities and uh, it will be left behind the market because then its competitors they will uh, they will they will uh, uh, bring in more changes in the market they might bring in more innovative products and they might win the uh, market share of from the apple as well right so in order to keep uh, your core competencies uh, your core competencies and if in order not to let them transfer into your core rigidities what you need to do is that you need to um, uh, constantly update them update your co core competencies and so that you can follow what is the, what are the requirements from the external environment right so in a strong cultures what happens is that there are your core competencies they are uh, they, they are they tended to convert into your core rigidities right and as a result the strategic drift happens so strategic drift is when you the organization is unable to changes in the organization are very much um, small and incremental and they're not enough to keep pace with the changes in the external market or the external environment then we have the uh, barriers to uh, diversity so the strong culture may eliminate strengths coming from diverse people there is uh, one of the barriers to uh, uh, diversity uh, uh, because of course there, there is this uh, the, um, uh, there is this clash when we talk about the diversity management uh, and uh, the, uh, there is this challenge for the managers because on one hand uh, they uh, we say that the, the diversity is really good for the organization because when the people of different backgrounds they are coming in the organization then uh, they can really bring in the new ideas and uh, the organization can really benefit from it from the innovative ideas and from the creative potential of the people and uh, the organization can really transform into an innovative and learning organization but uh, the implications of this for the managers are on one hand when the people of b different backgrounds and the different uh, ideas are coming then 
some of those people they may they may bring their own values and they may bring their own ideas with them and as a result their ideas and values they may not match with organizational culture and there might be a conflict between the two so the organization what it would try to do is that it would try to bring a match uh, between these two and as a result the all those organizations those those individuals they might have they may have to they may, may be forced to change their values and their behavior and so as they can absorb well in the organizational culture so then that it is a barrier to diversity when the uh, individuals they are losing their uh, their unique points Uh, in order to be assimilated into the organizational culture then the organization uh, culture it can also be a barrier to acquisitions and mergers um 15 8% of the mergers they fail due to the cultural barriers the mergers that take place between the organizations uh, because that uh, when when the merger is taking place then the the two organizations uh, the two identities when they are combining when they are joining hands then uh, they, the the managers they might be they can be the conflicting values and the con um, may be mismatch in the opinions and the value system of the two uh, two types of employees that are joining together and who have to work together now so the this mismatch of culture that is a uh, contribute that shows to be a major reason in the failure of these acquisitions and mergers so now the companies when they study the other uh, the financials and the other ratios and uh, the other aspects of the mergers and acquisitions which were considered important ones now they also consider the cultural aspect of this merger and innovation this is also considered equally important so one uh, the, it is that uh, all, uh, organizational culture it is the ma the top managers or the ceos of the company when uh, the, um, the the company is being founded then he is basically responsible because he has to start up with a, to start with a company he is basically the first person who is uh, who is uh, bringing in uh, who is bringing in his ideas and on the basis of his ideology uh, of his beliefs of his certain assumptions he uh, builds the organization he found makes the organization and he uh, builds on passes on those same expectations to the employees and the members and he is thus the founder in uh, in uh, forming the organizational culture then of course it can be promoted the organizational culture it can be uh, 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 form it, it, uh, there are certain other factors as well such as the selection at the time of the selection you tell the candidates that what are your expectations and you com provide complete information to the candidate as well about what the organization is like so at the time of the selection the candidate gets strong signals about uh, what the organization is like from the selection procedures of the organization from the fairness procedures it uses from the ethical procedures it uses the candidate gets signals that how the organization is like like what it values and what it puts emphasis on right so at that time you need to make a fit between the person and the organization by checking on uh, checking out what are the values and the cultures of the organization and whether he can fit in with the organization and within that particular job requirements Uh, then the of course the top management as we discussed that the senior executives they help establish behavioral norms that are adopted by the organization so they act as role models themselves and they uh, uh, um, uh, uh, they are themselves the role, mo role models for the employees on how, what is expected and how they should behave then the socialization uh, process it also helps the new uh, employees to adapt to the organization's culture so it is the uh, philosophy of the organization's founders then the selection criteria then the top management acting as the role models and the socialization uh, different socialization processes in the organizations they all contribute to the formation of the organizational culture the socialization process when we talk about it there are three different uh, there there's there are three stages in the socialization process one is the pre arrival stage then the encounter then metamorphosis and then it leads to the number of outcomes so let's have this discussion on these stages one by one the pre arrival stage is the stage which um, in which the individuals norms and the values that are formed is socialized with even before entering the organization such as uh, individuals in the business schools they are being familiarized with uh, with how what are the requirements of the different uh, firms or the different business organizations who hire the mbas uh, what is the culture in those organizations what what are the expectations from the those mba graduates uh, uh, by those in their in potential employers right so uh, they are also given the uh, even sometimes they are also given the short visits to those companies uh, during their uh, it is part of their uh, course work that they go to the to visit to the different companies in order to familiarize themselves with the norms of that those organizations of those business entities and sometimes the organizations they also arrange the courses uh, from the uh, from the from the business executives for those mbas or the other business students right 
um, that is the familiarization or socialization at the pre-arrival stage then the encounter stage when the individual actually enters the organization then he sees that what are his values and what are the organizational values what are the organizational expectations then he actually sees and he also identifies there if there is a mismatch between those two so if there is a huge dichotomy between his expectations his values and what the organization actually is then the individual may resign but it often does not happen uh, then the metamorphosis stage is that if there are any differences between the two he tries to absorb the organizational values and culture into himself and he tries to internalize with those organizational uh, cultural values and then of course there are the formal versus informal that training and orientation programs versus no special attention employee put directly to job right so the that is the informal method where uh, there is no attention there is no uh, to to the training and the formal ways of uh, socializing then there there is this invest uh, investiture and the divestiture in which the emphasis is uh, certain qualities that are required for the job and it's not flexible and in the divestiture the socialization tries to strip away certain characteristics of recruit then um, the individual versus uh, collective where the new members are socialized individually uh, in a collective way then they are the members they are uh, uh, they share their identical experiences and then they are sh uh, they are they are socialized collectively then we have the fixed versus the variable the, in the fixed uh, um, uh, culture the time schedule in which the newcomer is programmed to socialize such as the rotation period for two months in this department whole employee development plan is scheduled whereas the variable is when there is no such plan and uh, there is no career path for the individual that how and after how much time he will be promoted or after how much time he will be rotated to this place and this place etc then the serial versus random serial is when role models they or the mentors they train the newcomer and the random is that there are no role models uh, and there are no mentors they have to do it all on their own uh, so uh, the research shows that the formal collective fixed serial and divested chore is socialization options they are adopted by the management they lead to greater conformity by the newcomers as per research so they tend to be more internal internalizing with organizational culture when the organization adopts these uh, options um then uh, of course uh, we, we are all familiar that organizations they use they use that stories from within the organization the success stories of the organization to familiarize the employees with the organizational culture then they use uh, different rituals then there are number of symbols that the organizations use that of the way of the by way of the organization the acronyms etc which are used to describe equipment processes key products or personnel that is simulate in organizational members and keep culture alive so um ethical organizational culture of course we discussed uh, many times this ethics uh, and the ethical standards and uh, we know that the ethical organizational culture is one that focuses more on the means than on outcomes how things are done how, whether they are done ethically or not 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 only emphasizing on the outcome that has to be reached right so they are low to moderate in uh, aggressiveness and they are they have high tolerance for uh, risk then um uh, the a uh, customer responsive culture that needs to be created right and uh, for that kind of t uh, culture the employee the types of employees that hired by the organization it is important to see uh, that what uh, what are the personalities of the employees some employees are more focused on service and some are not then the low formalization the freedom to meet customer service requirement Im empowering the employees is important in making decisions so that they can more accommodate the customers right and uh, then rule clarity that allows service employees to act as boundary spanners and the employees who engage in organizational citizenship behaviors they also tend to report higher customer responsive culture or they tend to be more responsible or responsive towards the uh, customers uh, customers and the, the customers are more satisfied with them so managers can do a number of steps to create this customer responsive culture such as select the employees with personality and attitudes which are consistent with high customer high service orientation then train and socialize the current employees to be more customer focused change organizational structure to give employees more control and empower empower employees to make decisions um then here we see that the organizational culture has an impact on performance and satisfaction right um, the more um, uh, of course the innovative and risk taking it is the more it gives attention to detail and the more other factors that we discussed earlier other characteristics of the organizational culture that we discussed earlier the more the higher the organization is on these then uh, this culture more is is uh, perceived as strong and it leads to high performance and satisfaction so the strength of the culture is very important determinant in uh, in determining the overall uh, uh, in determining the outcomes in the organization 
so here I have a few questions for you that uh, try to answer these questions um, uh, uh, after reading the um, uh, uh, try to solve these these yourself and then try to see the answers right so uh, these this 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 was um, <coughs> the discussion that we made today on uh, what the organization organizational culture is uh, is we had a discussion on how uh, the uh, different organizations they can have uh, different uh, cultures right and we discussed a few key characteristics that can that that uh, differentiate one culture from the other we also discussed that how the culture be it becomes the identity of the organization and it uh, not, not only for the organization but also of the employees they need to identify with the culture how uh, the uh, individuals they can be uh, they can enter into the different uh, uh, socialization process processes and so on so we uh, just had a, a whole lot of discussion on all these uh, different um, uh, topics in the organizational culture I hope you had a good good listening thank you very much Allah Hafiz